This video will further discuss the components of the Hartree-Fock energy for the helium atom. So again, we have our helium atom. We have a nucleus of charge 2 plus fixed at our Cartesian origin. We have two electrons, which are free to move anywhere they like in three-dimensional Cartesian space, x, y, and z. The electron 1 is a distance r1n from the nucleus attracted to it. Electron 2 is a distance r2n from the nucleus and is attracted to it. And the electrons repel each other and are some distance apart r1, 2. Our total Hamiltonian in atomic units is the kinetic energy of electron 1 plus the kinetic energy of electron 2 plus the attraction of electron 1 to the nucleus plus attraction of electron 2 to the nucleus plus the repulsion of the electrons from one another. So minus 1 half del squared 1 minus 1 half del squared 2 minus 2 r over 1n minus 2 r over 2n and plus 1 over r2 plus 1 over r12. Our wave function is a function of the three Cartesian coordinates of electron 1 and electron 2. So it is a six dimensional function, which we are approximating as two, the product of two independent uh, three dimensional Cartesian functions, one of each which depends on the coordinates of each electron. And these individual one electron functions are called orbitals. We've defined an effective Hamiltonian in Hartree-Fock theory for each individual electron, where h effective is equal to negative one-half del squared of that electron, so kinetic energy of that electron, minus 2 over r1n, its attraction to the nucleus, plus the effective Hamiltonian that it feels due to the repulsion of all other electrons. That effective Hamiltonian is an approximation, but we do it by integrating over all possible locations of electron 2. We have psi star of R2 times psi of R2. The wave function times its complex conjugate is the charge density of that electron. So we have its charge density divided by its distance from electron 2 integrated over all possible locations. So electron one does not feel electron two exactly, but it feels the effect of its average charge density over all locations in space. It feels the mean field of electron two. So the Schrodinger equation that we have for orbital one is that the effective Hamiltonian acting on orbital one, the mean field Hamiltonian acting on psi one, gives the orbital energy epsilon one times psi the orbital of electron one. Alright, so let's look a little bit into some components in Hartree-Fock theory and look at some of the, the terms that go into these orbital energies and the total energy. Alright, first we have the one electron operators, little h. Little h sub i is for the ith electron, so in this case this could be one or two, but it could be any electron number in general. This is equal to the kinetic energy of the electron and plus its attraction to the nucleus, negative one-half del i squared minus two over r i n, one, two, three, etc. Um, then that's the operator. The expectation value of the one electron energy is equal to the integral over all space, all possible coordinates of electron one, so minus infinity to infinity in x, y, and z, of psi star Ri times the one electron operator acting on Ri. So we have our one electron operator, the kinetic energy and nuclear attraction energy of electron one. This is the expectation value or the average value of that energy. So this would be called the one electron energy of electron I. What we're also going to define now is a integral called the Coulomb integral. So J12, you might notice one component there is from this effective Hamiltonian. So J12 is going to be the integral over all space for electron one and the integral over all space for electron two of, we have psi star R1, psi R1. Psi star times psi for R1 is the charge density of electron one. Psi star R2 times psi R2 that is the charge density for electron two. So we have the two charge densities of each electron at two given points in space, 
divided by how far those points are apart. So how likely they are to be at each of those points divided by how far those points are apart. Integrated over all possible points. So this is the average repulsion that the average charge density of electron 1 feels relative to the average charge density of electron 2. So this Coulomb integral is just the integral of each of those charge densities repelled by the 1 over R12 operator. Then our orbital energy, epsilon i, is just the expectation value of that effective Hamiltonian operator for the given electron. Our effective Hamiltonian operator being its one electron operator plus its effective um, mean field that it feels from the other electrons. All right, so for electron one, the orbital energy of electron one is going to be its one electron energy, kinetic energy plus nuclear attraction, plus the repulsion it feels due to electron two, J, the J12 integral. The orbital energy of electron two is going to be its one electron energy, its kinetic energy and nuclear attraction, plus its repulsion from electron one, which is also J12. If you trade the indices of R2 and R1 here, you'll notice that you'll get the same integral. All right, so how does that compare to the energy of the total uh, atom for Hartree-Fock? Well, the energy of the helium atom in Hartree-Fock is the expectation value of all five of these Hamiltonian terms, which is the one electron energy of electron one, this plus that, the one electron energy of electron two, this plus that, plus the expectation value of 1 over R12, which is our Coulomb integral. So if we sum our orbital energies, we get H1 plus H2 plus 2 J12. So notice that the total energy of the helium atom is not equal to the sum of the orbital energies. It is equal in the one electron part, but in the two electron part, what happens is your orbital energies end up double counting the repulsion of the electrons from one another. So that's a problem we'll discuss more in the future, but take notice just for now that the orbital energies in Hartree-Fock are not equal, the, the total energy of the atom is not equal to a sum of the orbital energies. So lastly in this video we'll bring up ionization potential. So ionization potential is how much energy it takes to take a single electron and rip it out of the atom. So take electron two, for example, and move it infinitely far away from this atom. What would be the energy it takes to do that? Or electron one, how much energy to take it to move it infinitely far away? So that would be the energy of this electron minus the orbital energy of that electron, approximately. So the total energy of the atom minus the orbital energy of electron one gives us H2. So it, you, would take away, you would take away the one electron energy of that electron because it wouldn't have kinetic energy anymore and it wouldn't have attraction to the nucleus. And it, the electrons would no longer be repelling each other. So you'd have the energy minus the energy of orbital one. The only thing that's left is the one electron energy of electron two. So this is an approximation because of course electron one would have a different one electron energy without electron two there. But for the most part, this is a decent approximation. So this approximation where we say that the ionization potential of electron I is approximately equal to negative of the orbital energy, this is equal, this is what is called Koopman's theorem or Koopman's theorem, depending on how intense your scrutiny of the German language is. So this Koopman's theorem says that we get our we can interpret our Hartree-Fock orbital energies as approximately being the magnitude of the ionization potential for that particular electron in our atom. And that's what we can use to interpret these uh, orbital energies since our orbital energies do not sum up to the total energy of our atom.